I want to introduce you to my grandpa. This is him, and that's me. You can all say, aww, a cutie. My grandpa was a really special guy. He didn't want much from life. He liked to fish, he loved his family, and he liked to be useful. He was one of these serial volunteers you found all around town delivering meals on wheels. He actually engineered a peanut grinder that's been reducing malnutrition all around the developing world. Not that he ever bragged about it. We had to wait until his funeral to find out how much of a difference this thing had made. And if you were to ask him, how did you get to be the gracious, loving, persistent, patient guy that you are? He would have been very embarrassed. He hated to talk about himself. And if you pushed, he would have said, following Jesus. It was the only answer for him. See, for my grandpa, being a Christian wasn't about believing a certain set of things or following a set of rules. It was a plugging into a power that actually transformed his whole life and, by extension, mine and a whole bunch of other people. Now I want you to meet my grandpa's church. This place was home base for my grandpa's faith and for his family for 60 plus years. They had church potlucks, picnics, their bowling team won trophies. But that was all 30 years ago. These days, if you show up at this church on Sunday morning, you're going to find a handful of people in the pews. I think when my grandpa died, their attendance went down 10%. They are facing a cultural shift. My grandpa spent the last years of his life trying to save this church. He learned to use the internet in his 80s so he could build them a website. When he died, I found a flyer in his apartment. Social media and live streaming for congregations. He was 86. But frankly, I don't think that live streaming was going to do it. The social shift that we're facing is something that all churches are needing to come to terms with right now. It's a much bigger deal. Today I'm going to talk about that cultural shift, what it means for the church today, and I'm going to try and give you a vision about why this conversation still matters. So here's to that cultural shift, huh? This image is from the Pew Religious Landscape study. They found that the largest and fastest growing religious group in the U.S. is the unaffiliated, N-O-N-E-S, the nuns. They make up one-fifth of the total U.S. population, and even scarier, if you're my grandpa, they make up one-third of younger generations. Now, I have to be very clear. I, myself, am very affiliated. I'm going to be a Lutheran pastor. But I know some things about the unaffiliated. I'm married to one of them. My husband grew up in a totally secular home. The first thing he remembers learning about religion, first time he even knew it was a thing, he was in fifth grade and a fellow student told him he was going to hell. <laughs> he remembers going to Catholic Mass with a friend once, didn't understand a thing that was going on, other than that it had nothing to do with him. If you would have asked him at age 18 or so to explain to a Martian Christianity, he would have said, uh, it's a nonsensical set of beliefs, mostly about what happens when you die, that for some reason makes people sexist, homophobic, and mean. He didn't want anything to do with the church. Why would he? Now, there are lots of reasons that people are unaffiliated with religious organizations. And some of them are because they've been deeply wounded by very dysfunctional problems in the church. But for many folks, like him, they just have no reason to believe that the church has anything to offer them or the world. Maybe they've seen evidence to the contrary. His story is a part of a much larger story. Some scholars call what we're going through right now a cultural climate change. There's still pockets of favorable weather for the church out there, but overall, the church is losing its position as the dominant social institution in the US. Now, some of you here might be thinking, good riddance. You don't have to raise your hands, but I know you're here. <laughs> some of you maybe are more like my grandpa. You're grieving this change a loss of a culture and a world that you knew that meant something very important to you. For me, I see this as an opportunity. Because here's the thing, 
the church may be losing its position of dominance, wealth, social prestige. But I remember that the way of Jesus, that guy that Christians are supposed to be following, in case you're taking notes, the way of Jesus was never about dominance or wealth or social prestige. In fact, it was the mm, dominant, wealthy, socially prestigious Roman Empire that was so threatened by this guy, Jesus, that they deemed him a criminal and had him executed. Some 300 years after that, the emperor Constantine converted to Christianity, took that same Roman Empire with him, and ever since then, the church and the dominant culture have been married. The church chose emperors, chose presidents, decided who was in and who was out. And all the while, this radical, countercultural way of Jesus wound its way on the underside of society. Today, that marriage between the church and the dominant culture is ending, whether we like it or not. And I think it's time for the church to reclaim that countercultural way of Jesus. I'm going to do what I can to explain that way to you in four points. Crash course theology lesson here. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> here we go. Point number one, God made us to be whole. We were made to be in full relationship with each other, with God, and also with the whole earth. Wholeness looks like flourishing. It looks like peace. It looks like mutual care between all creatures. But look around for a minute. Anybody been watching the news? I don't know. Doesn't seem like we live in that wholeness. You don't need to read the Bible to see that something is broken here. But if you do read the Bible, and professionally I'm supposed to recommend that you do, <laughs> you will find that over and over it's full of stories where God shows up, not to people who have it all together, but in the middle of the brokenness. Which brings us to point two. God moves into the neighborhood to make what is broken whole. Christians believe this crazy thing that God showed up on earth, moved into the neighborhood in the person of Jesus Christ. And the neighborhood that God moved into was a backwater corner of an oppressive empire where God was conceived out of wedlock, born into a despised religious minority, became a child refugee, and hung out with the worst sinners he could find. God decided to dive headlong into human brokenness and said, I would rather die than let that brokenness get the last word over you. I would rather be broken myself, and followed through. And this is where it gets really crazy, and I know that this doesn't make sense, but I'm telling you it's the only thing that makes sense out of my life, that on the third day he got up out of that grave and somehow brokenness got broken in that. Point number three, we're invited into the adventure of that restoration. Maybe you've noticed the word is, world isn't restored to wholeness yet. The exciting part is that we are invited to play a key role in the restoration of the world to wholeness. Yes, us, we, with our Netflix addictions and like your secret racist thoughts and like the whole pan of brownies you ate last night. <laughs> Maybe that's just me, I don't know. <laughs> We're invited to play a key role in this and given the Holy Spirit as a guide and as a power for that. It's an invitation to walk that countercultural way of Jesus and that way leads us into death which leads us into life. It leads us right into the heart of our own brokenness and the brokenness of our communities and through it to wholeness, not just for us, but for our neighbors too. Point four, we're free to fail. To me, this is the best news of all because it's not what people think that they're gonna hear from the church. We're free to fail because that invitation comes with a promise of unconditional love and presence and forgiveness. It means that we don't have to get it right. It means we're free to experiment, to try and fail. It means we're free to rest when we get tired. It means we're free from judging ourselves, free from having to judge anybody else. And it means we're free to love our neighbor just because they're lovable, not because we're in trouble with God if we don't. So where do we go from here? What would it look like for the church to reclaim this radical and countercultural story in a time when the world is changing. I see two areas of growth for the church to dive into right now. It's time for us to live deep and time to live wide. So living deep, 
means knowing what we're here for. Okay, listen, the church is not here to be a social club. It's not here to be a heritage preservation society where we get to eat our favorite hot dish and sing our favorite hymns. And it's not here to be a social service agency. There are other organizations that do a better job of that than we do. So if we're not being transformed by learning to walk the way of Jesus in a way that also brings wholeness and transformation to our neighbors, let's all go home and sleep in on Sundays, okay? So what does it look like? How do we get there? I think it means a deep dive into spiritual practice. And this is something that other traditions are getting in on too. Because this way of Jesus, it doesn't come automatically, folks. There's a reason it's on the underside. Practices like prayer, like studying the stories of the people of God in scripture, like taking Sabbath rest, a million other things I could name. These aren't our ticket to heaven. They're training for walking the way. And it's time for the church to step up and be our locker room for that. Living wide means opening our ears and our eyes and our arms to the neighbors who are around us. It means it's time to realize that the way of Jesus isn't about what happens in our church walls. It's not about Sunday school. Sorry to say this is a great preacher. I don't know if I'm great. It's not about great preaching. It's about plugging into a power the power of the spirit that affects every nook and cranny of our lives. So it ends up being about how do we talk to ourselves when we're disappointed in ourselves? How do we talk to our spouse when we're angry? And about how do we spend our money? How do we engage with our neighbor who's different from us? What would it look like for the church to be a place where people learned to walk in wholeness in all of those ways? I think that it would mean it would be a place where we got outside of our walls. It means meeting people where they are, actually the same place we already are, in the middle of our shared brokenness. It means following God out into the neighborhood. Now, the future of the church is very uncertain. I'm not going to lie to you about that. And I can't give you a formula, a program, a five-step strategic plan that's going to bring us back to my grandpa's glory days. I don't think it's going to happen. I kind of don't think it should. The Spirit is only showing us one step at a time of this journey and calling us to the courage to take it. I don't know where this adventure is going to lead, but I do know that the invitation is for all of us, whether you're more like my grandpa or more like my husband. This path is open to you. I hope to see you on the way. Thanks.